All right, welcome to American Civil War today. And on today's show, I'm very uh, pleased to have Eric Powell with us. Eric Powell is one of the people that are that is um, heading up the um, Fredericksburg 150th uh, battle reenactments um, down there on down there at Fredericksburg. Uh, you guys are calling it the um, fire on the Rappahannock. So uh, welcome to the show today, Eric. Thank you very much. Okay, um, why don't you just kind of give us a brief intro introduction on on your background and your position within the um, within the events. Okay, um, I am the uh, curriculum and instruction specialist for social studies for Spotsylvania County Schools, which is the county right next to Fredericksburg. I've uh, lived in this area for over 20 years and have been reenacting for about 19 with the 47th Virginia Infantry. Uh, and uh, got involved with this reenactment probably about a dozen years ago, doing some living history uh, programming uh, around the anniversary of the event. And so this event has kind of been uh, about a dozen years in the making of, of building up to what we hope will be a special event uh, this weekend uh, or this uh, December. And with this event, I am the chairman of the Battle of Fredericksburg Commemoration Committee, which was a committee that was created to kind of coordinate uh, all the events of this weekend um, in order uh, as part of the Virginia Fredericksburg Regional Susquecentennial activities. Okay, great. Let me just kind of just make one comment. So in case you're wondering, people are wondering when exactly it is. It's from December 7th to December 9th. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about more more details on that later. Yes. Um, before we talk about the events, can you maybe just kind of give us um, a little bit of context on the Battle of Fredericksburg? Why did it happen? Why was it important? You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, the uh, Battle of Fredericksburg was in December of 1862. So uh, this December will be the 150th anniversary of it. Uh, this is coming after uh, the Battle of Antietam, in which uh, Lee was... Uh, uh, stopped in his first advance into the north uh, and then retreats back into Virginia. Um, in letting Lee go, George uh, B. McClellan is removed from command by Lincoln and Ambrose Burnside is put in command of the Army of the Potomac and once again is going to go and attack Richmond. And instead of going up the peninsula like McClellan had, he decides to go via land, uh, following down uh, what would be the 95 corridor today to Richmond, which Fredericksburg lies halfway in between D.C. and Richmond, and is the site of uh, four different battles uh, here in the in the community. Um, when he gets to Fredericksburg, where he arrives in Stafford, which is north of the Rappahannock River, he finds that the bridges have all been destroyed, and he wires up to D.C. to send pontoon bridges so that the army can cross the river. Rather than moving upstream and finding fords and crossing, he decides to wait for the bridges to cross right at Fredericksburg. It takes a couple of weeks uh, for those bridges to arrive. And in the meantime, Lee is able to move his army in, cross the river further upstream, and slide in south of the city on the heights overlooking the city of Fredericksburg. And uh, able Just to build one, a one strong- quick question, One quick question here. And if you may not know the answer to this, but it's it was it not customary for our, the Army of the Potomac or, or you know Burnside's Army at that time to travel with a engineering corps or a pontoon, you know, a pontoon um, regiments? They had engineering regiments that would travel with them, but not necessarily uh, hauling those big pontoon bridges. Each one of these pontoons is probably about 40 feet long, probably weighs a couple thousand pounds. Uh, they're made out of oak and they're they're quite heavy. Uh, so they would have them up around Washington with the Potomac, and they would have them in other locations, uh, but those engineers would not uh, travel with those pontoon boats with them, per se. Okay, so they get there, the bridges are destroyed, and now they wait for the pontoons. Yes, and Lee's able to get in a position on the heights overlooking the city, anchoring uh, on uh, the bend there, the Rappahannock from uh, uh, north of the city all the way around to the south side of the city, and on December 11th, uh, the bridges will be there, and the engineers of the 15th New York, 50th New York, and regular Army uh, engineers begin constructing the bridges at about 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Lee has left a small force uh, under McClaws, and in particular Barksdale's Mississippians, to keep an eye and give him an alert uh, that the Union would be crossing. And so they hear the construction starting there in the morning, and when the sun starts to come up, and they can see the engineers working. Those Confederate sharpshooters begin shooting at the engineers. Um, the engineers will, will pull away from the riverside and the Union artillery will open on the city. 
And actually, the Union artillery had already pounded for a while uh, on the city. Um, but there'll be this back and forth that happens where the artillery will pound the city and the sharpshooter will take cover and then the engineers will come back out. And then when the artillery stops, the sharpshooters pop back up and shoot some more. And then the engineers go off and the artillery opens up and this goes back and forth for most of the morning. Finally, about in the middle of the afternoon, uh, the um, uh, General Henry Hunt, the artillery commander, suggests that troops be sent across the river. Uh, in pontoons, in the pontoon boats themselves that the bridge is built on, the pontoon boats, that floating bridge, to clear those sharpshooters out so that those bridges can be built. And so we have one of the first uh, amphibious assaults in American military history uh, under fire, in which elements of the 7th Michigan, the 19th Massachusetts, and then others will get in those pontoon boats and row across the river and land on the Frederick side of the river and begin to engage those sharpshooters and establish a bridgehead and then clear out the streets. And we will also have one of the earliest um, times of urban combat in American military history as they fight through the streets, driving the Confederates out, uh, giving Lee that warning that uh, the Union Army was coming. And so that's pretty much where the first day on December 11th will end, will be the Union taking the city and the Army will cross on the 12th and occupy the city, they will loot the city, and on the morning of December 13th, Burnside will launch his, his attack on Robert e. Lee's position. Burnside's plan was to attack mainly on his left, Lee's right, against Stonewall Jackson, uh, and that would be where the main assault would come, and they would do a diversion on the right, coming through the city and attacking the heights there beyond the city that's known as Marie's Heights. The uh, Franklin's original assault against Jackson is successful, and there is a breakthrough over at the Slaughter Pen Farm over at Prospect Hill, but Jackson's able to bring up reinforcements and stop that Union advance. And meanwhile, that assault against Marie's Heights just turns into a bloodbath. The uh, artillery that's up on top of Marie's Heights is able just to pound those Union soldiers as they cross over the mill race, the canal that's a freshwater canal that's coming through the town, and then the almost mile wide field. Um, that makes up a lot of the city and the neighborhoods of the city today was open fields that those soldiers uh, charged through. The Confederates at the base of the hill were behind a stone wall, so they were in an entrenched position behind a stone wall and just mowed down uh, the Union soldiers. Uh, the Irish Brigade came the closest. It, I think it's like 25 yards they came within the wall, but none of the Union soldiers will get all the way to the wall. Um, Burnside in tears will offer to command another assault against the wall. They assault it like 11 times, uh, and his uh, officers will convince him that it, it, it's pointless. Lee, watching the battle from up on top of Marie's Heights, will utter the famous quote, it is well that war is so terrible, else we grow too fond of it, as he sees this victory that he's won, but the massacre that's happening uh, in front of his lines. Um, the Union Army will be pinned down the night of the 13th and all day on the 14th under uh, Union uh, Confederate fire. Uh, many uh, wounded soldiers will freeze to death at night because it is December. And uh, the, one of the famous stories to come out of the Battle of Fredericksburg is Richard Kirkland from South Carolina, a sergeant that goes out and takes water out. He's among many people who went out to take uh, water and, and, and comfort out to those Union soldiers. So it's a, a great example of compassion brother against brother type of story with the Civil War in which Confederates are taking out water to the wounded soldiers. Finally, on the 15th, the Union Army will withdraw back across those pontoon bridges and set up winter camp in Stafford County, where they will be uh, from December all the way until the next spring when they march out for the Battle of Chancellorsville um, in what's been called by some people the uh, Union's Valley Forge, a horrible cold winter uh, after a, a crushing defeat. Um, morale is very low. Illness was very bad uh, in those winter camps. So I'm just, I'm just want to double check this. So was was the actual battle three days or four days? Well, it, I mean, it, including everything, including the initial um, pontoon action and then the re, and then the withdrawal. Yeah, from the 11th to the 15th would be the the four days that it would take place. The first uh, day being that crossing, uh, and then a day in which they occupied. The third day being that big assault, and then the fourth day being that um, where they were pinned down after the defeat, and then the fifth day when they withdraw. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we'll move into um, the events. I just want to add a couple of kind of hopefully interesting comments. One is General Burnside. Um, he actually had a quite a good um, North Carolina uh, campaign um, in, in late 61, 62. So 
he, you know, he did have some success down there in North Carolina, um, but it's generally accepted now that it, the, an army command at that scale was kind of beyond beyond him. Secondly, there's an interesting quote about from Lincoln, and I saw this at the um, at Fort's Theater where Lincoln was was shot, and it was Lincoln said, um, "If there is a worse, if there's a place worse than hell, I am in it." Referring to after the Battle of Fredericksburg, yes. so it kind yes. of gives you a, a good, it kind of hopefully gives the listeners a good context on just what was an absolute um, tragedy, for really a lack of a better word. Um, for the for, for the Union troops. Okay, so let's talk about. Um, I would add one more thing, oh, if go I ahead. Could, Charles, yeah. is that you know this battle takes place just a few weeks before the Emancipation Proclamation uh, is issued on January first, eighteen sixty-three. So after the victory, somewhat of a victory there at Antietam, he does the preliminary proclamation announcing that you know the, um, that it's going to go into effect January first, and then following that victory and that, you know, that high point there with the Emancipation Proclamation, the Union Army offers this massive defeat. And that's part of why that morale is so low um, as they go into the first of the year with the Emancipation Proclamation going into effect. And you've got thousands of enslaved African Americans who flee to the Union Army in Stafford County. Uh, part of the events of the whole Susquecentennial over the five-year period that we're doing programming here in Fredericksburg, uh, we did a program last spring on the crossing uh, and, and kind of uh, telling the story of those 10,000 slaves that are believed to have fled. We've documented about 208 um, so far that have fled across the Rappahannock River to freedom uh, with the Union Army being there in Stafford. Okay. Wow. So, okay. There's obviously a lot going on. Um, let's try to let's try to focus in on a bit on December 7th to December 9th, 2012, for the 150th anniversary. Um, and then I'll, I'll let you, you can have the discretion to talk about the type of um, you know, events and activities that people can can see. Yeah. Um, the week it's actually a week from December 7th through the 15th. It the whole week-long celebration that the community is doing with the weekend of December 7th through the 9th being the main weekend. Oh, okay. With, okay. with the anniversary of the battle being a Tuesday through a Friday, we had to pick one weekend before or after it. And so it's the 7th through the 9th. Um, the 7th is a school day program for local school kids to come out and visit the camps as those are all being set up. And we've got a number of living history programs going with the school children. And then on Saturday, December 8th is the uh, reenactment focus of the weekend. Uh, we will be doing two battles. Uh, the morning battle starting at 10 o'clock is the whole river crossing street battle portion of the of the battle that took place. Uh, with that one, we are building two reproduction full scale uh, pontoon boats that uh, we will have Union soldiers that will row across from George Washington's Ferry Farm over to the Fredericksburg City Dock, which is the site of the middle pontoon cross. Uh, and in addition to that, we have the 189th Engineering Company from the Virginia National Guard is going to be uh, assembling a uh, modern ribbon bridge, which is the descendant, I guess you would say, of the pontoon bridges from back then. This is what the Army uses now. And so they are coming out and assembling this ribbon bridge across the river uh, so that after that initial rowing across and fighting along the river and the action moves up the street, then the uh, rest of the Union Army will actually cross over that ribbon bridge. Uh, this will be the first time that the Army has pontooned the Rappahannock River since the Battle of Fredericksburg 150 years ago. So this will be something really unique for people to see. I mean, it's not every day you can see the historical pontoon boats and pontoon bridge in action as well as the modern version. Right. And, and, and we throughout the entire weekend, uh, we're kind of it's a juxtaposition between um, what happened back then and in cooperation with kind of how that ties in to today's military as well. Um, on the um, Sunday program, I'm jumping ahead, uh, but the descendant units of the Stonewall Brigade and the Irish Brigade uh, will be down here for part of these commemoration activities. So we kind of have that connection between the two. Um, the other thing is that we will have uh, Thaddeus Lowe, uh, who was the hot air balloon guy, will be doing reconnaissance for the Union over in Stafford. Was he, was he actually there at the historical battle? Not during the battle, but prior to the battle okay. when um, uh, the Union Army's there. And actually throughout, you know, kind of that winter, the Union Army would do reconnaissance by, you know, sending up a hot air balloon. So that's something that we talked about having for a number of years for this event. And we're going, finally going to have him down here uh, to recreate that. Uh, the Civil War Balloon Corps uh, is coming down to to tell that story of something that's unique to Fredericksburg again. Um, we'll have a period telegraph. 
uh, a number of field hospitals um, on both sites, uh, as well as throughout the city. We'll be telling the story of the, how civilian life is impacted uh, with the battle, refugees, the, the field hospitals, um, the life of the citizens throughout the city in a number of different locations uh, all over town. And then the afternoon battle on Saturday is the assault on Marie's Heights, the Irish Brigade assault on Marie's Heights. And we've you know, recreated a fake stone wall uh, there on the campus of Mary Washington University. And the Irish Brigade will uh, once again assault that and uh, the Confederates will be behind that position. And so uh, it'll be, the, the, the piece of the land is Trench Hill, which is part of Marie's Heights, but not the part where it's the actual national park. So throughout this weekend, we are on historic ground. Uh, the Union will be camping in Stafford County at Ferry Farm, which was the site of the Union camps. And the Confederates will be camping out at the Slaughter Pen, which is that Confederate right, that Union left, where that breakthrough was on the Union assault uh, under Franklin's command. And so the uh, Confederates will be camped out there and there will be tours by the Park Service and other living history programs out there uh, telling that part of the battle story as well. And then the assault on um, Maurice Heights is there on actual piece of Maurice Heights that's on the college campus. The um, other things that are going on, we'll have, you know, the generals will be there. Uh, we'll have a number of uh, unique lectures and tours uh, that the Park Service will be doing throughout the day. Uh, the historic Fredericksburg Foundation Incorporated does an annual candlelight tour in the city, and that will be at Brompton, which is the president's house that was there at the time of the battle. Uh, there on on the college campus we're overlooking Marie's Heights and then Brayhead, a new house down on the Prospect Hill on the other end of the battlefield um, that has recently come uh, open to the public. And so that's a, a Christmas candlelight tour that the Historic Fredericksburg Foundation does. So that will be going on at the same time. So and, let, me, let me just kind of like just clarify something for the listeners. So basically there are, there are lots of different activities and it's sort of a collaboration between different historical societies, the National Park Service, your organization and others to yes. bring a whole type of um, a series of events and different types of events for really just a whole, I mean, just different people will be interested in seeing and, and doing different things. There's lots of different opportunities um, for, for people out there basically. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the kids programming to, you know, indoor lectures, to walking tours, to bus tours, a uh, whole week's worth of, of activities and learning uh, that will all take place. And the big culminating event will be on Sunday, December 9th. That's where the Park Service has the main lead that day. That will begin at one o'clock down at the river. They will be recreating the, uh, the hundred rounds a minute that uh, was part of that artillery when the artillery opened fire on the city, it was said that 100 rounds a minute were uh, poured into the city in that artillery barrage. And so with a fireworks display, they're going to open that procession program up with that uh, 100 rounds in a minute to, to kind of recreate what that was like, be a procession with um, uh, through the city uh, to key spots along the way, telling the story of the Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, reenactors uh, doing field music, firing volleys, number of things interpretive along the way. It'll all end up on the sunken road there at uh, the, the Fredericksburg uh, National Military Park Visitor Center. And all the participants will be given uh, a carnation, either a white or a red, with the red being the correct proportion of casualties in the battle. And there, there will be a lane of carnations across the stone wall there, um, a number of, of, of comments and speeches and music that's done. That's where the descendants of the Irish Brigade and the Stonewall Brigade will be there. I think the Irish ambassadors come in, the Irish color guards coming over from Ireland. Um, C-SPAN will be there. The uh, Virginia Susquecentennial Civil War History Mobile uh, will be there. And this uh, is all on Sunday, December 9th. Uh, yes, okay. and that starts at one and proceeds through the city and the culminating experience at the Park Service uh, Visitor Center is at three o'clock that afternoon. Meanwhile, the camps for both uh, uh, Stafford and Spotsylvania will be open and there'll be living history programs continuing again for a second day throughout the city. Okay, I see, I see like one of your events is a, um, a DHL lunch and lecture. We actually had um, the, the gentleman who portrays DHL on the show a couple of weeks ago. So that's okay. That's cool. Yes, he's doing that down at Port Royal. <laughs> And yeah. so how, this expands. How, how far is Port Royal from, from Fredericksburg? Uh, it's about a 40 minute drive from the city. Down okay. The, okay. So this is really, I mean, some of the events are, are around the area and encompassing other 
other related areas, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the Fredericksburg Area Museum and Cultural Center is doing a Civil War art show um, and, and doing some kids programs. The Central Virginia Battlefield Trust is doing an author's uh, reception where you can come uh, meet a, a couple different authors, uh, Robert Crick and um, from the who else they got. Um, oh, I can't, oh, Gary Gallagher will be there uh, in a reception that they're doing, uh, which you can find on their website, cvbt.org. Uh, okay. So a number of programs, like you say, lots of historic organizations and community groups are all participating uh, in this program. Uh, that procession will have the bells tolling throughout the city from all the churches that are participating. Um, this is kind of a signature event of a whole series of events we're doing throughout the five years of the Susquecentennial. And we're very excited about it. Okay. Um, is there anything else you want to add or... No, if people want more information, uh, I would suggest they go uh, to a couple different websites, okay. www.fredericksburg150.org or visitfred.com okay. or the National Park website, www.nps.gov slash FRSP. All right. And we'll definitely, we'll put all of those, um, all those links in the, the podcast post. Okay. So for, if you're listening on iTunes, um, and you want you didn't you know quite catch that or you you know kind of want more more information um, go to the American Civil War Today .com website and look at look at this podcast and then you can you can see a little more you know, some more details and as, as well as all the links or um, yeah or just go to Fredericksburg one it's one Fredericksburg one five zero dot org thank you the, the numbers <laughs> um, okay Eric I think mean, I think that's great um, I, I mean I'm actually I will be there for the weekends. Um, Saturday and Sunday. Um, really looking forward to it. I think you know this is it's a really unique experience, and um, I mean I think you've you've outlined uh, you know a lot of the great um, opportunities for for people. You know, and I think I think I know hopefully what at least what I'm getting across is like even for people that are not you know American Civil War buffs or anything, there's just so much going on. It's something that really anyone can appreciate. Um, so I say at least go for a weekend. <laughs> great. Yeah. Um, okay, Eric, so thank you very much, and uh, maybe I'll run into you down there uh, next month. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Have a great day. You too.